The Susan Brenda Show is a radio show online broadcasted on YouTube across the United States and globally. The show features guests who speak about health, spirituality, entertainment, and a host of subjects to enlighten people across the nation. Listen to the show that empowers women and men alike and highlights those who have made a difference. I'm Susan Brender, and this is The Susan Brender Show. Today, I have a very interesting guest on my show, and his name is Jamie Allen Sassoon. He's a Florida licensed attorney and the managing partner for the Ticton Law Group. And I want to welcome Jamie Sassoon to The Susan Brender Show. I'm really looking forward to interviewing you because there is so much that you have to talk about. I'm sure our audience is going to really be appreciative because you know what you're doing as a lawyer. And that is really a very special thing. So welcome, Jamie, to the Susan Brenda Show. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. You know, I'll tell you something, Jamie. You're working with the Tickton Law Group, and I interviewed Mr. Tickton, and he is the greatest, I mean, wonderful, wonderful lawyer who really represents a lot of people, and so do you. Now, let me ask you something, Jamie. Tell us about your work and what you do for people needing help with probate, living wills, and estate planning. Yeah, sure. So it's a, as I said, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I've been a lawyer now 18 years, and 17 of those 18 years, I've been at the same law firm, which is unheard of nowadays. And I've been with Peter Tickton the entire time. I'm, I owned uh, some of the business, and I'm the managing partner. We have uh, 15 attorneys. At one point, I had 35 attorneys. And uh, we, you know, we handle all different types of law, but something I really and passionate about is uh, wills, trusts, you know, helping elderly people, um, you know, set up, you know, very basic things. Because I, I think a big problem is a lot of lawyers out there, they make things overly complicated. And why do they do that? Typically, because they make more money. You know, it's the old uh, saying about lawyers. It's, you know, that's right. Client. So, yeah. You know, Jamie, there's so many scams that take place for older people. And I, you represent them. And how, how many have you actually represented and have you really won the case? Because needless to say, these scams are horrible and they take place when people are older because those are the people who really yeah. get, you know, get into trouble. Yeah, well, we've I've definitely, you know, I've handled hundreds of cases, but specifically on that point, you know, probably 15 to 20 specific cases where, um a elderly person was exploited either by a caretaker, a family member. Sometimes it's the next door neighbor. We see that a lot. Um, I've seen ones where the person passed away and the lawyer basically scammed them out of the money. So, I mean, it's, it's anyone who can gain a position of trust with an elderly person, which happens a lot because, and they, there's a statute, Susan, in Florida called the Elderly Abuse Statute, uh, Exploitation of an Elderly Adult. And it specifically deals with that. And because it happens a lot. Um, right. So I'm very well versed. In it. And I, I've been very successful. Our firm has done really well in these type of cases because usually the wrong's there and you just correct it. You know, you show court what happened. You know, one of the things that I think people want to know is when you represent somebody, you, you probably have a lot of stories to tell because when you represent all these people, there is one person who are, probably stands out. So tell us a story about one of your cases. Yeah, that's always exciting to do. So, I mean, one of the cases I always remember is, um, you know, my client's uh, aunt, and this is usually the case. It was the aunt who had never been married, no children, and yet they're eight years old and all of a sudden they're worth six million, four million dollars because they were really good earners and they saved their money. So that's where usually, so I had this one case, it was in Port St. Lucie, where my client, the, 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 the uh, niece, her and her aunt were as close as, as thick as, thick as, you know, so close together. And they got into a fight for about a week. And during that one week, the next door neighbor somehow got himself involved in the house. My client was out of it and had the, the elderly lady sign over her house. Mm -hmm. signed over her uh, bank accounts and put this person on her life, uh, life insurance account. So we found out about this when the, you know, the person passed away and we sued the next door neighbor and he defended, he hired a lawyer and said the entire time that uh, 
she wanted me to have everything. She cared about me. And, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately it took through litigation and we were able to win the case. Um, so you see a lot of those uh, situations, you know, where they really, um, you know, you know, really get themselves their claws into the elderly person. Yeah. Now there's something called probate law, which you really, you know, deal with a lot. And um, I, my question to you is, should people, regardless of age, should people get wills and trusts and estates? Because otherwise they can, they have to probate law, right? Yeah. Well, the, definitely it's, it's important for someone, everyone, you know, to do a will, which is not expensive. You know, most law, like our firm charges 425 bucks. So it's, it's, it's very reasonable. And, uh, you know, the will basically says, you know, when I die, this is how I want my money to go and what to happen. And, and what, and the good thing, what I suggest to people when they come in for a consultation, what I would tell them is you take all steps to avoid probate because what probate is, it's the courts basically okaying where the money can go. But if you can do things prior to your passing away, it avoids the court's intervention, it avoids creditors. So certain mm -hmm. things people do, which a lot of people know it as, there's things called POD and TOD, POD, TOD, P is in Paul, uh, T is in Tom, and you can do it at the bank. It's just naming your beneficiary in your bank account. And what happens is second someone passes away, we have that form and the bank automatically transfers the money to the beneficiary. If someone doesn't do that, then the money has to go into po probate. So think of the money having to be transferred over into the court registry to hold the money, if that makes sense. Then the court, the creditor period and all that stuff. So, um, but the will is important to make sure that it says what you want to happen. And then there's a living will, which I'm sure you've heard of before. And that's, you know, the do not resuscitate and, you know, that things, if certain people, you know, they keep people, it's the, the Terry Schiavo case. Do you remember that from the, um, the early two, early 2000s? Yeah, well, I do, but I'm not yeah. sure my audience does. So why don't you talk about it a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, I think it was about 2004, if I recall, there was a lady named Terry Schiavo who basically was in a coma and there was no bringing her back, but she was alive and she could have been held on life support and all that for years. So her husband wanted to basically say, end this, this is too much, you know, like, I don't want my, and the doctor said, well, she's comfortable. She's on pain meds, blah, blah. So governor at the time was Jeb Bush got involved and filed a bill, which basically said that um, she, her husband could not end her life, that she was going to be kept on the feeding tubes and all that until she naturally passed away. And people were outraged by this. Yeah. And why does, why did governor Jeb Bush want to do that? Because he was it either um, that people should have the choice to not be put to death without a documentation, or is it really because it makes the hospitals more money? You know, that was the, at the time, you know, it's a lot of money for the healthcare. The more you're in the hospital, it's, it, it creates more revenue. So what this does is the uh, living will basically says, if I'm found, and it really discusses three doctors, three doctors certified say that there's no way that I'll ever come back, that I'm basically in a vegetative coma, that I do not want to be held alive, kept alive, basically unnecessarily. So I will only be giving um, medicine for pain and basically just to keep me comfortable, but they're not going to just feed me food to keep me alive. Yeah. And that's really important. I mean, 98% uh, of people do not want that. To they, they want to be basically able to die in a normal manner. So that's something that a lot of people do not have, which they should have. Because yeah. without that, that's how, what happens. What about litigation? Um, there are so many cases that are litigated in courts. But the thing is that some people really, I mean, look at what's going on now with the BLM, Black Lives Matter, and all of these different political situations. Do you ever litigate somebody who's killed somebody? Well, we don't do criminal uh, type of case, but I've done some a couple of wrongful death cases. Um, right now, we have a big case against Walmart um, where a guy was shoplifting and basically uh, he fled the store and uh, Walmart, for whatever reason, it's in the uh, the report, told 911 that he was armed with a gun. 
So he basically got shot, I think, 22 times. It's been in the paper a lot. Yeah. So we've had that. And obviously, you know, we've had, uh, you know, accident cases where terrible things happen, you know, hospital, uh, medical malpractice cases we've, you know, been involved with where just horrible things happen in hospitals, which, um, you know, the more you read, the more it scares you from going into a hospital. So yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's, you know, litigation are to keep, you know, the systems in check, you know, as you know, all the bad things people say about lawyers, if not for lawyers, you know, insurance companies and there'll be uh, in hospitals, there will be no way to really get you know, retribution and get compensation for the families. Yeah. You know, you started at a very early age. What motivated you to be a lawyer? Oh, good question. So I, uh, my family has a lot of lawyers in it, you know, for my great uncles, you know, early people, immigrants to New York, that was kind of the the way that uh, my family kind of, had. but the biggest influence, I have an uncle, uh, an uncle Lou, there's a lot of people, have uncle Lou's, and okay. he's from Boston and he's a big lawyer, always ran his own law firm. I just always, as a little kid, I was, as my dad's older brother, and I always looked up to him. I just remember like, you know, he had the Porsche and he just, he like kind of had that Michael Douglas motif growing up, you know, he just looked like a cool guy. And um, yeah, I just, I would just always kind of like, we go to like bar mitzvahs and things. And I, he introduced me to his partners, you know, I'm a little kid, I'm taking this all in. And I just really liked that. It's just something about it seemed really cool. So that was, I think the biggest thing. And I ended up going to a law school in Boston where my uncle went to law school. So I kind of, it was funny because I look back, it was so subconscious. It's not like I had this, you know, I think I should do that. Just kind of like something led me there. So it's, it's yeah. really interesting how that works. You know, it's like ingrained in your brain. Yeah. You know, as a young guy, you're experiencing manage, managing a law firm office. That is really a very big task. Now, your company has how many people working for it? We have about 50 people right now at our peak uh, when I was a manager about during the mortgage foreclosure you know, crisis, our firm was the largest in the state of Florida defending people, keeping them in the homes. We were in the papers a lot, but we had about 100 employees at that time. So yeah, that was, that was quite, a, quite a task for personalities. Yeah. And the, the other question is now, and this is a really important question, do you deal with employment law and real estate law? Can you speak to us about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I've always, uh, you know, something that's made me, in my opinion, a really good lawyer is I learned at a young age to do all different types of law. My partner, Peter, who's been a lawyer 50 years, we handle all different types. And it, it's, you know, most lawyers get pigeonholed. You know, I, I just do insurance defense. I do this. So, you know, one of the things I really, really enjoyed at a young age was employment law. And, uh, you know, just because, you you know, the clients come in and you hear story after story, you know, age discrimination. I have a case now against a Haitian lady who, uh, her coworkers, you know, were making comments about her race and her smell and her food, you know, just really disgusting things, you know, that, that get people get away with. And really, it's really sad when you see someone subjected to this. Um, you know, my, my biggest case, um, I sued uh, Florida Power and Light a couple of years ago. Um, it was a nuclear whistleblower case where he was the, the chief, one of the head uh, safety officers. And uh, it was a really an interesting case, but they basically, he got terminated and, you know, we settled the case. So can't get into the, the terms of it. It was, it was really an interesting case to learn from, for sure. Now, I want to tell you something. This is a very personal situation, but many, many years ago, I lived in New Jersey and mm -hmm. what happened was a guy hit me with his car and a pole fell down on my car. And then what happened was my leg was just, I broke my heel and the people said to me, if you live in a place like Bergen County, New Jersey, be careful. And I asked why. And they said, because you'll see that it's a rich area. And as a result of that, you're not going to get what you think you're going to get. Well, what happened was my lawyer told it, you know, everybody. And I had people like doctors and lawyers, you know, really dealing with it. And they wanted to settle. And they, unfortunately, my lawyer said to me, no, don't settle. You're going to get a lot of money. And P.S., what happened was I got nothing. 
So the question becomes, if you're a lawyer, what is your responsibility with regard to telling people what they should be doing? Do yeah. you think that they, they should be doing or telling you or sh should you be telling them? Yeah. So the, the question to that is it's actually in the Florida rules of professional conduct. And it's a rule in our firm is we, the lawyers, make all decisions regarding litigation, what we file, what we determine needs to be done. But the client, and this is the law in Florida, the client has the ultimate say in all settlement discussions. The lawyer is required in Florida, I think most places, to com communicate every single settlement offer to the client. So taking that, taking that, putting that aside, the client's obviously coming to the lawyer for you know, advice. Um, you know, what should I do here? Because it's the first time for many people. So, you know, there's two different ways to look at it. Yeah, if you go forward going to trial, you can get more money and you could win the case. And obviously you could lose the case, but you'll never know that until you, you know, as they say, you know, roll up your sleeves and go at it. Or you could settle the case, which is, you know, uh, what's the saying, uh, bird in the hand. You know, you don't have to go through the whole thing of trials, you know, it's safety. You're going to get less. So those are the things you have to, you know, look at. And then what I do, uh, Susan, which I learned from Peter is, you know, you really got to counsel the client and really say to them, is this really what you want to spend your next four years doing? You know, mm -hmm. lawsuits keep you stuck in the past. You know, yeah. it's not healthy. You know, you're the person that you hate the most, you know, because we do a lot of business, you know, disputes. The person you hate the most for the next four years, you're going to be waking up thinking about that beast. You know, it's not a good feeling. And then there's an old saying, which a lot of people like is never wrestle with a pig because a pig loves to get dirty. <laughs> So, you know, these are things that, you know, you want to tell clients because you never want them to look at you and say, Jamie, how did you get me involved in this case? Why didn't you tell me? And I don't want to do that. You know, I may make some more money, but that's not where, that's not why I became a lawyer, you know, you know, so. Yeah. Well, lawyers, the reputation of lawyers are, are not always great. A lot of people say, unfortunately, that lawyers take advantage of them. Uh, and how do you answer when somebody said to you, well, you know, I went to another lawyer and he wanted to charge me X, Y, Z, and I thought that was too much and I'm yeah. coming to you and I want you to tell me how much money you're going to charge me. Th this is, it's a money job in, in a way, is it not for many yeah, I mean, lawyers? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a service, you know, you're paying for the lawyer's time, you know, which is how many hours are in a day. And unfortunately, there's some lawyers who do, um, they see it as continuous, uh, you know, revenue stream. So yeah, they want to, they rationalize it. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing what I can for this person. I'm trying to, but then the day they're, they're getting, they like that $2,000 every month coming in. So I got, oh, let me do a little work on that case because, you know, I want to get the uh, work on our firm. You know, we hire, you know, lawyers. We don't actually require they meet a certain amount. We check their hours because I have to just a monitor. But I don't say you have to work 60 hours a week, bill 60 hours a week, because that creates, uh, Susan, that kind of atmosphere where there's, yeah. we say to our lawyers, do the work that needs to be done to win the case. Yeah. And that's not the norm. It's not the norm, but it's how we do it. What about women? Are women becoming lawyers more than ever? Yeah, women are becoming lawyers. And I have to tell you, I love women lawyers that we hire because they're just incredible. I mean, I just see such a, um, they're just so uh, organized compared to the men typically. <laughs> um, right. But it just it really, we've had just some, some great law. We have great lawyers here, female lawyers. So yeah, I mean, it's definitely, since I became a lawyer in 2004, I mean, just a huge shift in it, you know, where, uh, it's, it's just where things are, and especially with judges. And, um, you know, I think it's 50-50 judges are female judges. Yeah, um, it wasn't yeah. like that, obviously. It was old, white-haired uh, men, you know, controlling the bench. So I think that's been really good. Yeah. I, 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 I know that we shouldn't get into politics, but you know, you know what's going on now with the Supreme Court and all of the cases that are taking place right now. Now, you, do you pay attention to that? And what do you think about what's going on? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I definitely pay attention to it. I actually um, was uh, got to, I luckily got to sit in on a Supreme Court case once about 10 years ago, it was pretty cool. But 
the um, you know, it's never been that's that's never happened before where someone's leaked a document like that. So it's really just, you know, I've talked to you know some people like no one can imagine that kind of breach. I mean, the person that did that is going to lose their law license. I mean, it's like unheard of. But, you know, it's just it's just something that happened. And ultimately, it's going to be really interesting. You know, are the is the judges going to do what it looks like they're going to rule upon? And are they going to basically succumb to the pressure and not do it? I think they're going to do what they originally planned. That's my guess, because the way it's written, it kind of says, hey, they make it more of a procedural issue. We don't have the right to basically make that decision. It's really up to, there's a balance between state power and federal power. And that's really what this is talking about. It really has very little to do with women's rights. It's can the federal government tell the states what to do? I mean, it goes back to slavery. I mean, it's it's the same fundamental issues, you know, states' right versus the government telling them what to do. So that's, you know, abortion will be uh, legal, I believe, in many states, but it's going to be up to the states. Yes. Um, but that seems like but, that's where the issue is. But there's so many people who disagree with what you're saying, and they want to protest. They want to tell everybody that Roe v. Wade is so important, and it's one of the most important uh, situations that they, you know, really want to vote for somebody who really feels about Roe v. Wade. And that's why Biden is, um, you know, talking about that. But the fact of the matter is that Roe v. Wade, if it's controlled by the states, you can have it. Nobody says you can't uh, have an abortion. It's just you can't have an abortion in certain states. So what yeah. do you, yeah, and so what, what is that all about? I mean, it's a, like my personal, you know, I'm, I'm for women's uh, right to choose what they do with their body. I do think it's good to have some measures of when it can be done. But so I, I would hope that there can be some type of median ground that can be met, you know, it, but, and I think that's where they believe the states are going to basically allow abortion, but impose certain limits, such as, you know, um, if it's very close to, you know, the pregnancy period, you know, those type of things. So I, I think that's going to be, if if they allow this to happen, I, I believe that's how the states are going to have it. I, I, I personally don't see, I could be wrong, that a state's going to outright uh, ban uh, abortions, but I, I haven't heard any state saying that they would intend to, but because I think right. that'd be wholly unpopular, like you just said. I mean, there'd be just uproar, and rightfully right. so, but Again, that's, that's right. my opinion. Well, so, your, believe me, your opinion weighs a lot. Now, yeah. let's talk about the case that you're dealing with now, which really I know that you can't talk a lot about, but could you give us kind of an understanding of what it, it's all about? Yeah, sure. So um, our, uh, our law firm is, uh, was hired um, to do some work uh, as local counsel on behalf of uh, Donald Trump. Um, who I know probably half your listeners like you hearing that and half don't. So I guess that's what makes okay. the, the role go around. So, um, so don't turn off the radio if you, you don't like them, but maybe you'll, you'll find some interesting. But we filed the uh, lawsuit, which was filed in federal court in, uh, against uh, Hillary Clinton, which has been all over the news um, mm -hmm. regarding the Russia collusion scam. Uh, my partner, Peter, uh, went to high school with Donald Trump at New York Military Academy in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. And um, they've always had a friendship. Peter actually was in his platoon. They lived in the barracks. And um, when Donald Trump was running for president in 2016, Peter wrote a uh, Facebook post, which went viral, basically saying, and this is when people were really, you know, going after, you know, Trump with a, a lot of, uh, well, it's always been a lot of vengeance, but there was a lot of negative talk about it. But Peter said, no, this person defended people against bullies in high school. He, everyone liked him. You know, he's a good man. So, you know, flash forward, that was in 2016. Um, six years later, you know, they reconnected. They've always seen each other. And um, yeah, we're uh, bringing this case regarding the uh, that Hillary Clinton, the Democratic National Committee, basically uh, conspired to set up this fake Russia collusion story um, during the election period. Could you give us a little understanding of Hillary Clinton and what you think about Hillary Clinton? Yeah, I mean, you know, from from what I've seen in the case, in in this, what's going on? If you the John Durham is a special prosecutor who was uh, basically appointed to basically investigate, 
you know, how the Trump, the Russia collusion, basically saying that Donald Trump was under the, uh, what had colluded with uh, Russia and that he was controlled by them. So it, it turned out that Donald Trump was clean, didn't do anything wrong. They wiretapped him, they list him. He didn't do anything wrong. So this John Durham recently, who's investigates, has found all this evidence that the DNC and Hillary Clinton basically paid a research group to basically dig up this story and make up this story. They paid like $11 million. It's all in the complaint. Mm -hmm. And that then with that false information, they then gave it over to the FBI. And there's some issues involved in the FBI, the higher ups, James Comey. And then they basically use that to get something called a FISA warrant. And what a FISA warrant is, it basically says, we have reasonable belief that this is happening, it has to be signed off on, and it allows the government the, the Department of Justice to basically uh, listen in on people's conversations. And that's what they did to Donald Trump and his family. Hmm. So yeah. this is the civil component, what we're doing, basically saying because of what they did, it cost Donald Trump millions of dollars to basically deal with this. Could you tell our audience, Jamie, whether you think you're going to win this case? Because it's real. I mean, when we talk about Hillary Clinton and all of the things that we hear on television about her and about the way things are operating, we're really a little uh, skeptical of what you know is going on. So from your standpoint, do you think there's a chance that you'll win the case? Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't have filed the case. Uh, again, we have the, the main attorney is Alina Haba. She's in New Jersey. Um, but we wouldn't have filed the case if we didn't believe uh, we had a good, we were going to win it. I mean, we have just the evidence from all the stuff that's already been done by John Durham. Um, and that's going on right now. If people are watching this, the Sussman trial, which is, um, I don't know if you've, you've seen that, but that's going on right now as we speak in DC, but Sussman was Hillary Clinton's attorney. And he's the one who went to uh, the FBI and said, hey, I have this information and why he's being charged criminally is because the FBI is claiming that he lied to them, that he never disclosed that he was actually working for Hillary Clinton. He said he was, wasn't working on behalf of any clients because yeah. they're saying if they had known the FBI that he was working for Hillary Clinton, they would have dealt with the information differently. Makes yeah, sense? It sure does. Now, you know, Jamie, this sounds like one of the most exciting cases that you've ever had. Am I right about that? Yeah, this is definitely at the way top. It, it's surreal in many senses. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's it's you, you just want to do the best job you can do. I mean, I, I believe in it. And, you know, that's that's it's really important to be in that way. I believe. And, have, and have you actually met uh, Donald Trump? I haven't met him personally yet. I've been at Mar-a-Lago a couple of times. I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, we, I definitely, we went there uh, last uh, two two Wednesdays ago. They filmed. Uh, there's a movie which I suggest your listeners read to. It's called I don't know if you've seen. It's called Two Thousand Mules. Yep. It's by Dinesh D'Souza, and uh, it, it has to do with uh, the the election fraud and that. They were stuffing of ballots. They have all these people. Uh, it's it's it, they actually released it in the theaters now, so people could see it. But it, it's really interesting. They have all the video, and they were able to track all these things down. So we were there for the screening um, at Mar-a-Lago, and you had really Rudy Giuliani, the whole cast of characters. So it was pretty cool being in the the whole uh, the mix of it all. Well, we're almost at the end of the show, Jamie. So if people want to get in touch with you, how do they do that? And are you um, do you have a book? Do you have something that we can advertise for you? Yeah, I, I don't have a book. Um, Peter has a book. It's called, it's on Amazon, What Makes Trump Tick? Uh, what Makes Trump Tick? Um, so you can find that. Um, and the best way for people to, uh, it's really easy. Go to the website, legalbrains.com. That's plural, legalbrains.com. Again, I'm Jamie Sass and I manage the office. I'm involved in most of the cases, but um, that's really the best way. Our phone number is 954-570-6752. Uh, and 954-570-6757. And we're 
in Hillsboro uh, Beach, right off of 95, right off of uh, Hillsboro Boulevard. So that's right. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Jamie, interviewing you because you're a young guy who's really had so many experiences and you're an inspiration to people who want to become lawyers. So I want to thank you Appreciate for it. being on my show. It's been a pleasure, really, truly. Thank you. It was fun talking and, and it really just hard work. And, you know, I've been going since I came out of law school, so it paid off. So I'm going to continue that way. Well, I'm glad to hear yeah, that. Thanks. Okay. So thank you again. Okay. Thanks.